In the history of modern warfare, his battlefield exploits were unparalleled. He was a professional soldier and proud of it. There is only one thing I am interested in, he declared, and that is war. His name is General George Patton, and this is his biography. This is biography. Our story, General George Patton. The American people admired George Patton as a flamboyant battlefield leader. They pictured him as a rough, tough soldier who wore pearl-handled revolvers. And the newspapers had a field day describing the exploits of the general they called Old Blood and Guts. But all this fanfare obscured the fact that Patton was a remarkable general. As a matter of fact, he was a remarkable man. All my life, he said, I have wanted to lead a lot of men in a desperate battle. And now I am going to do it. That was how George Patton felt as he entered combat in the Second World War. War, he said, was his destiny. Patton Jr. is born in 1885 in San Gabriel, California, the son of a wealthy businessman. He grows up with just one ambition, to be a soldier. As a boy, he even calls himself Lieutenant General George F. Patton Jr. And young George is encouraged by his father. Patton attends the Virginia Military Institute. And then in 1904, he goes to West Point. Cadet calls Patton a purebred gamecock with brains. In 1916, Lieutenant Patton goes off to war to fight against the rebel insurrectionists in Mexico. During this campaign, Patton hunts down a dangerous bandit general and kills him in a blazing gun duel. One is an even greater adventure for George Patton. Arriving with the first American troops, Patton says, I hope the war lasts long enough for us to try our hands. Patton becomes the Army's first tank commander. With its armor and firepower, the tank is a weapon of attack. This kind of combat appeals to George Patton. letters to his young wife back home, Patton describes the carnage he sees, his being wounded, even his narrow escape from death. More than most men, Patton is profoundly moved, even exhilarated by the dangers and heroism of war. The battlefield, he comes to believe, is his natural environment. After the war, Patton, now a colonel, attends the tank school at Fort Meade in Maryland. There he meets another officer, Major Dwight Eisenhower, and they begin what turns out to be a long and unusual friendship. As the years pass, Patton studies the potential of tank warfare. He is certain that someday, in the event of another war, the tank will emerge as a major weapon. demonstrates the power of the tank at the beginning of the Second World War. His mechanized panzer divisions soon sweep across Europe. When the United States is drawn into the war in Europe and in the Pacific, career officers like George Patton are called upon to lead the American Army. November 1942. General Patton goes into combat. Successful 
successful invasion of Morocco. Now, Patton meets with British General Sir Harold Alexander in Tunisia. Patton plans to lead a surprise attack from the rear on the forces of Germany's great tank commander, General Rommel, the Desert Fox. in the Tunisian desert. Rommel's 10th Panzer Division is smashed. leave 
lead his third army into battle. He knows that the controversies that have swirled about him have tarnished his reputation. He desperately wants to vindicate himself in the only way he knows how, in battle. to the north. 
Ford to the bow. General Eisenhower asked if Patton can make it in three days. Patton makes it in two. But soon, bad weather hampers the Allied Army, prevents them from scoring a decisive victory. And Patton, who frequently writes poetry about war, now writes a prayer. He has it distributed on printed cards to his men so that they can join him. Merciful Father, says Patton, we humbly beseech thee to grant us fair weather for battle. Christmas Day, 1944. A break in the weather. The Allied Air Force once again can pound away at the enemy. Patton challenges the Germans with his tank. help, the German counteroffensive is smashed. Hitler's armies are crumbling. Patton's troops push themselves almost beyond endurance. His men are fiercely devoted to him. They would follow him anywhere. Now they follow him against the German Siegfried line. to the stupidity of man cracked easily. In his headlong rush across France and Germany, Patton's Third Army captures nearly a million enemy soldiers. He conquers 82,000 square miles of territory and 1,500 towns and cities. It is one of the greatest achievements in the history of modern warfare. George Patton has wanted a chance to do something spectacular, and he has done just that. German concentration camps are overrun by the Allied armies in the last days of the war. Patton could always accept the death of soldiers in battle, but this kind of horror sickens him. On May 8, 1945, the war in Europe is over. Patton is now a four-star general. He writes to his wife, Peace is going to be hell on me. I will probably be a great nuisance. And he writes in his diary, Another war has ended, and with it, my usefulness to the world. General George S. Patton, Jr., now an almost legendary figure, returns home to a hero's welcome. special ceremony in Los Angeles, he shares honors with a comrade in arms, Army Air Force General Jimmy Doolin. I'm pleased and proud to have been privileged to fight by the side of General George Patton. Unfortunately, there were no Germans to kill in the ocean, so we couldn't tell what it would look like when the Navy worked on it. But we know from experience that when the Navy works on things, 
the things are damn well worked over. You must remember this. That from Brest to various towns in southern Germany and Austria, whose names I can't pronounce, but whose, whose places I have removed, <laughs> Air Command and the 8th Air Force is marked by more than 40,000 white crosses, 40,000 dead Americans. The Allies have paid a tragic price for victory. But Patton says, let me not mourn for the men who have died fighting, but rather let me be glad that such heroes have lived. the Army of Occupation. But now he also has time for brief intervals of relaxation. Another storm, however, is about to break over his head. He has suggested to other officers that the Soviet Union is a growing menace, that the United States should go to war with the Russians immediately, before they get too strong. Patton has even volunteered to start the war with what he calls military incidents. Patton makes a final error. To help restore public works projects in Germany, he hires civilians, some of them ex-Nazis. Unthinkingly, he compares current hostility towards the Nazis to a democratic Republican election fight. Now General Eisenhower can no longer protect his old friend. He realizes that Patton has no love for Nazis, that he had simply made a rash and impulsive remark. But too much harm has been done. Eisenhower relieves Patton from command of his beloved Third Army. Patton's close friends say that this embitters the old warrior. His name is under a cloud, and he faces an uncertain future. Suddenly, tragically, George Patton is dead. He had gone hunting in Germany. His jeep crashed, and Patton was fatally injured. He is given a hero's funeral. Patton had been a violent man, violent in emotion, in speech, in action. But this was part of his greatness as a combat commander, as a leader of men. From the time he was a boy, that is all he ever wanted to be. On Christmas Eve, 1945, General George S. Patton, Jr. is laid to rest with men who loved him. The men of the Third Army who died under his command. A statue now stands at West Point in tribute to George Patton. In the words of a fellow officer, it didn't hurt America to have a general so bold that he was dangerous. That despite his brilliant victories, he would always be a controversial and in some quarters an unpopular soldier. But war, he once said, is very simple, direct, and ruthless. And he added, it takes a simple, direct, and ruthless man to wage war. Mike Wallace for Biography.